Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Go ahead, take out your copy of God's Word and join with me in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. Starting with the first verse. I come from an interesting generation. Back in the days of World War II, people from marketing firms decided to use some psychology to um, basically to market what we call the cohort effect. What does a generation endure? How does that mold and shape them? How does that turn them into a, a people, a group, within a certain age bracket. And I believe the age bracket chosen was a period of 20 years. This particular group of people, strangely enough, named themselves the greatest generation. The ones that came after them, their children, became known as the, the baby boomers. And they took a look and looked at the baby boomers, took a look at Woodstock, scratched their heads, and when it came time to, time to, to, to predict what would be the psychological impact of this new generation, the generation of the late 60s, early 70s, the generation that would follow the Woodstock generation, the countercultural generation, strangely enough, the generation which was the first generation born where human existence itself was seen as optional with the coming of the atomic age. All of this stuff was taken into account, and as they thought, they thought, they thought, they decided rather than adding a descriptor to the generation that I was a part of, they gave it a letter. Generation X, the unknowns. They said that through the course of those that uh, would be a part of the group that I represent, that we would have no heroes, no examples, that like the countercultural revolutions of the 1970s and late 60s, that we would balk at authority, and that all the systems, that all of the supports, that all the foundations of the the nations that had been established up to that point would simply be rejected. This was a wide, a wide sweeping prediction. This was painting an entire generation with a very broad brush. But I say all that to say this. Some of us did not have heroes in our own families that we could look at point to and see godly examples in our lives. Some of us had to look outside of our families. Some of us decided that, that things were so awful that uh, in, in certain sectors that we actually wrote and created people to be heroes. Characters that were portrayed in media. People who exemplified what it means to be strong and courageous and yet at the same time gentle. A leader through fortitude, not power of will. But in my case, in my small quarter of southeastern Kentucky, I was blessed by God to have three examples. One was a World War II veteran who helped to save the world in no small part by liberating North Africa, Sicily, and Italy the patriarch of, of the Robbins family, 
who taught me what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And who also taught me that no matter, (laughs) come what may, that he would be there for us. And I remember one summer as I was trying to help him with some landscaping, right as I had completed high school, back in the days when I, I, I was not as horizontally gifted as I am now. I actually helped him to trim a, a giant um, evergreen out from his front yard and Again, this is shortly after my graduation, and I'll never forget it. Remember, this is a guy who, who in my young eyes, had helped to save the world, helped to raise a family of five. And he looks at me and he says, Jason, you know, I'm proud of you. No idea what I'd ever done in that man's eyes to get him to say that, and yet it was there. On my mother's side, I had a tall gentleman who was also a World War II vet, but he had a a much harder battle. He battled through, uh, he battled through his health, through physical weakness, through um, trying to help provide for his family as best as he could. Yet a lot of his physical mobility and his, his once- considerable strength was robbed of him. He had Parkinson's disease. And yet he held on. A testimony of a virtue we call fortitude. And through, through sheer dogged determination, he helped to provide for his family by taking a a several hundred acre farm that had been uh, grown up for several years and turning it into a working farm again, complete with livestock. Now granted, he had me, my little brother, and my dad to help, but he still worked nonetheless. He had a spitfire temper, what we call a Swiss temper. It came very easily and very quickly, but just as quickly it ebbed away. A gentle, wonderful man, an avid storyteller who encouraged me and my little brother to use our imaginations, to think outside the box, to think of things, no matter how fantastic they might be, to consider all options and to keep reaching to the future in a way that would make ourselves into better people through education. And lastly, and probably most profoundly, I had probably the best dad that any child could ever ask for. Not only did he coach all three sports, I come from Kentucky, incidentally, that's baseball, basketball, and football. uh, Football is kind of iffy, granted it's Kentucky, but we'll keep going. He he was someone who, who... who encouraged athleticism, and yet some people who have that kind of strength, who have that kind of power, who receive that kind of authority can be bullies. They can be uh, people who, who, who wring performance out of people by guilting them into it or by, uh, by telling them that they're not good enough until they, they work themselves into a frenzy. But I was blessed to have an example of someone that, uh, that was loving no matter the circumstances, who had a lot of strength and charisma, and yet instead of inspiring people to work their, their tail ends off because he made them or else, he inspired them to work because they didn't want to let him down. He was a strong leader, not in terms of bending people to their will, but in terms of of showing them that he was not going to ask someone else to do what he himself was not willing to do. He was a giver. It still is. Someone who who never wanted the spotlight, 
someone who became a deacon of the Baptist church, not because, it, it, not because he wanted to make a show of himself, but because he wanted to help. And he was, he was possessed, and still is possessed, of, of a deep curiosity about so many things. And I'm happy to say that in a generation where we were told that we wouldn't have heroes, I had three very good ones. The culture that we live in right now tells us that to study that kind of masculine leadership is toxic. That the virtues of strength, fortitude, wisdom, knowledge, determination, resilience, gentleness, patience, self-control, does any of this start to ring a bell? That this can't happen, especially with a human male. But when you strip someone of their identity, what do they have left? There's a reason that we have godly men in our lives. And it's not to take away our own personhood as the people that follow after them. It is to show us the way to encourage us, to strengthen us, to teach us, to mold us, to protect us, and to nurture us in in profound ways. And this is what God says. This is what the Word of God says about what a godly man is supposed to look like. Taking a look at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Now, Moses had ended his ministry. Moses has ended, his, has ended his ministry. And like so many godly examples of a strong, strong person, a strong man, he was looking for someone who had the ability to lead, but not the desire to lead. Someone possessed of a humble heart. And the burden fell on, jo- on Joshua, the son of Nun. And this is the way the Word of God describes him and describes his ministry. Joshua chapter 1, starting with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, river, the Euphrates, to the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will also be with you. I will highlight this in your copy of God's Word because this is God's message, not just to the person of Joshua. It is also His message to any man of God, any person of God that has taken up the call of God. It is an example of God's integrity and God's personality. I will never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. That's the God we serve. Here's his instruction to the men of the faith. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from it to the left, to the right nor to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. This is where the, the, the initial tradition of Torah memorization began. Not just keep it on the shelf at home. Not just read through it unoccasionally. But memorize it. Be ready to regurgitate it. Keep it not only in your head, but also in where? Your heart. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. This is what was being told to Joshua right now. Drift neither from the right nor to the left. Stay on course. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. It's the most commonly issued commandment in all of Scripture. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word this morning. Remember who you are called to be. Remember who you are called to be. Remember in whose name you go. Understand the Word of God and be strong in it. We have a very poor understanding when it comes to strong leadership because we think of it as being able to, by force of will, subjugate someone else. That's a very corporate mindset. What are the three great laws that were given to us by God? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your... Love your neighbor as... And the one Jesus Christ gave to us upon the first communion. Love one another as I have... Loved you. Three great commandments. Love God, love one another, love each other. That means that the central virtue of all that is, all that is the religion, all that is being of God, simply put, is loving. The same way that He loves us. And that's not easy. It's not easy to be a loving person when you are being gossiped against. It is not easy to be a loving person when somebody claims that they can do something better than you can, and yet they never do. It is not easy to be a loving person when you come into a place or where you go somewhere where you do not feel welcome. And yet, it is not, and it's certainly not easy to go be in front of somebody who you've never met and try to invite them to a church that they've never been inside. Yet this is biblical strength. It's understanding that God is always with you and that it is not only in your own, it is not in your strength that you go, nor your own wisdom. It is in whose? It is God's. Be strong in the faith. Remember that He is the one that takes responsibility for your, your growth, for your development. He takes responsibility for you becoming the person you have always been created to be. Being convinced of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will also do what? Will also draw it to completion. This is how Paul writes on being strong. And this comes to us from 2 Timothy uh, 3, 10 through 17. This is a father in the faith speaking to a son of the faith. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, Faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, my fortitude, my passion, my willingness to love, my willingness to obey God. Bless you. Those are the hallmarks of strength that he's talking about. Take from the example, use that example, run with that example. You know my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Everybody that had, had, had come up against me, and yet I kept going. The person who was shipwrecked, who was beaten, who was stripped of, of the rights that he had to assert himself as a Roman citizen, not to be beaten, not to be strung up, not to be prisoned without... Uh, Without trial, through all that he had gone through, he still persevered in the faith. His testimony, the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. We are not... <laughs> if you're not persecuted... For your faith. Watch out. Because you've just seen the word of God where it is promised to us. That's why we have to be strong. That's why we have to be dependent. That's why our faith has to come first in everything that we are. 
Well, evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you've learned it, and how from infancy you have been known, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through your faith in Jesus in Christ Jesus. Be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. All in our society today, there is this pandemic, not of a virus, but of, the, of this desire to say, I'm okay, you're okay. The need to justify one's choices, no matter how sinful, no matter how polluting, no matter how God dishonoring that they are. But here Paul is telling us that no matter the persecutions, no matter the temptations, no matter the hostility, no matter how much and how often they can attack you, hold on to the faith. Be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Not try to conform Him to you. Fathers, you are the high priests of your household. In fact, the Word of God tells us about a special judgment that we will have to endure as someone who has taken upon themselves the responsibility of being a father. Did you teach? Did you live out an example for your children? Christ. Were you strong enough when the world was telling you that's what's bad is good and what's good is bad. Where evil is rewarded and where good is punished. Were you strong enough to stand up and to still be a reflection of Jesus Christ in their eyes? Both in conviction and in love. Were you strong and courageous? Were you found practicing and preaching God's Word in your homes, not being contented with that small hors d'oeuvre that you get on Sunday morning, but feeding your children richly from Sunday to Sunday in your living rooms, at your kitchen tables, on the rug in front of your fireplace. Were you truly the pastor of your own home? especially in times when it was not very convenient to do so. I'll, I'll take a, a second to branch off from there. And, and my apologies for not putting this on the screen. Um, one of the things that I became convinced about as I was starting to prepare a series on the book of Revelation, which is upcoming, um, there have been a lot of misteachings about the mark of the beast I want to, and I know that that's, this seems like an oddball place to mention that, but just hear me for a second. The swastika and the hammer and sickle were dress rehearsals for this. In Revelation, John tells us that this is something that the coming world dictator imposes upon others in not a covert way, but a very overt way. Now, what do I mean by that? There are those that teach, uh, that, that, that try to teach because there's something going on in the world that they don't agree with that XYZ equals the mark of the beast. That's not what's going on in Revelation. What's going on in Revelation is that the coming world dictator will want you to wear a symbol proudly and boldly that you belong to him. And again, if you think about it through the course of history, there are other times where that has happened. Where a party was formed that had an insignia that they wore proudly and boldly in front of other peoples to say that I belong to or I agree with this other person. And it grew in popularity. So more people took that mark upon them. And as those people went from being electable to being in power, 
all of a sudden it became very unpopular and downright hostile for a person not to have that symbol on their chest. That's what we're talking about here. Not something that is hidden to be, not something that is hidden, but something that is overt. The enemy wants you to side with him. He wants you to want to be part of that crowd. He wants you to run away from God, to not be strong enough to stand your ground, and to be stand up and to be counted with everything that Christ stands against and that Christ stands for. To wreck the world that we're a part of in, in such a way that when he picks out who the new coming world leader is in Revelation, that that will be seen as the only person that you can come to. Do you understand what I'm talking about? We're not talking about a shot or a vaccine. We're talking about something that the enemy wants the people of this world to stand up and be counted with, to show and to make a show out of, to stand against the cross of Christ. That's what it means to be strong and courageous. When things come down upon you, when society itself rewards evil, and subdues good, to stand up instead and say that this isn't right, that Christ demands better of us, that he who died for us requires that we remain vigilant so that others might be saved. Be strong and courageous. Romans 8, 31 through 33. If you don't have this uh, written down in your copy of God's Word, do so right now. I've preached on it a couple of times, but it bears repeating in this instance. What then shall we say in response to these things? Remember, the Rome that Paul had grown up with had perished. Paul knew about the Republic. Paul knew about a Rome where being a citizen meant that you were protected, you were sheltered, and you were free, Pax Romana. If you uh, practiced a religion that was not the central religion of the Roman Empire, up to this point, that was okay. But there came a point where a dictator of the Roman Senate decided, uh, Caesar Augustus, decided that, no, that's not good enough. You will worship me. You will now worship me. See, all of history is cyclical. But he's telling the Christians who are in the lion's den of Rome right now, who are being told to make sacrifices to Caesar or to perish. He's writing this to them. What then shall we say to these in response to these things? If God be for us, say it with me, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us what? All things, you are an inheritor. You are a... A, a, you are an heir of the very king of this universe, but it's our responsibility to make sure that more of the harvest comes in. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God himself who justifies, meaning that the judgments of any earthly court of law, any court of Caesar, whatever the case may be, is nothing in power Nothing in power and scope compared to the judgment seat of Christ. He further goes on in 2 Corinthians 10, I beg you, I beg you, that when I come, I might not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Note this. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with, notice, hold on, notice this, the weapons that the world fights with is not what the Christian answers with. The world would fight us with intimidation, with pressure, with uh, threatening our very lives and our safety. That's not the weapons of the Christian. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. 
And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Who is it that takes revenge against wrongs? Vengeance is is mine, saith the Lord. It is mine to repay. Our job is to be a living example of the kingdom on this world. And for those of us who have been pegged to be fathers, it's our responsibility to demonstrate how that works. Paul would later refer to this as the full armor of God. We are people who are called to look different from the world, to gain the attraction of others, even in the darkest of times. I want you to think about this for just a second. Christianity is not, generally speaking, is not a a religion that grows from a people with full bellies. But where love is at a premium, where love is at a premium, where there is destitution, where there is hunger, where there is horror of war, Christianity thrives. Right now, the major epicenter of our religion, strangely enough, is in Africa, South America, Asia, countries that are both hostile and uh, where people don't know where their next meal is coming from. But they're turning to Christ because the love of God gives them hope. The exhibition of the love of God to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to shelter those who are in harm's way, to visit the prisoner, to be at the, at the bedside of the sick, that is what causes people to understand that there really is something to this Christ thing because unlike every other religion of this world, we worship a God that loves us. And that's the other piece of the puzzle of being a strong dad or a strong man of the faith. Be loving. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. We're talking about mutual submission. We're talking about God's ideal of the perfect household. Paul has already told his listeners, for wives to be... um, loving and submissive to their husbands. Now let me caution you that this is one of the most abused passages and doctrines of all of Scripture. Because what this sets up is the relationship between the husband and wife as being one where love carries everything. Where love carries everything. Mutual submission to each other. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what? Gave himself up for her. Died for her. Gave his life for her. To make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. In other words, there doesn't, no power dynamic, no power struggle will exist in a household where love is the rule of the day. If you love your wife, Love, agape, which means what? Self-sacrifice. If you love your wife and your wife loves you with that kind of love, there will be no power struggle because both of you will be working together in tandem for the same end. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church for which he gave his life. Be loving. Understanding that love conquers all. 
hopes all things, forgives all things, endures all things. Love conquers all. I'll leave you with this last thought from the book of Joshua that kind of encapsulizes all three elements. Be strong, be courageous, be loving. Joshua 24, starting with verse 11. Joshua is giving his last sermon before the people of Israel before his own death. And he's reminding them of the reliance on God, both in his wisdom, his timing, and in his power. And he's, he's really pointing out the fact that none of the glory that you have experienced to this point, both in terms of the military and in terms of the homes that you've just acquired, none of it comes from you. All of it comes from God. Verse 11, And you went over Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, and the Termites, and I delivered them to you into your hand. Who is it that conquered? God. Who is it that fought the battles? God. Who was it that gave, took these homes that were already constructed and gave them to the people of Israel? God. Not the Israelites themselves. They owe God. I sent the hornets before you, which drove them out from before you. And the two kings of the Amorites but not with your sword, not with your bow. And I've given you a land for which you did not labor. I'm sorry, in my own text, I copied the wrong version. I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you yourselves did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all your faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if in serving the Lord, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those of you that are dads, and for those of you who aspire to become them, I want you to remember this. That without a knowledge of what defines a godly man, we are hopelessly wandering in a wilderness of our own creation. Strength does not require someone to be overbearing, someone to be abusive, someone to be domineering. <coughs> Strength requires gentleness, meekness, patience, self-control. Be strong. Be courageous. Remember the Word of God. Hold fast to the Word of God and to the love that it demands of us even and especially in the times where it seems not only inconvenient, but downright dangerous, knowing that God himself is the warrior that goes before you. Be strong, be courageous, and be loving, especially with your families. As the pastors of your own household, it's not a position to dominate others with, but it is a position of service. The word pastor actually means what? Shepherd. The word deacon literally means what? Servant. This is what we are, first and foremost. Jesus himself said it. If any of you expects to be first in the kingdom, he must be the last. If any of you wants to be great in the kingdom of God, he must be the, the least. He must be your servant. He must be your slave. Be Strong in your convictions. Be courageous in living them out. And love God with everything that you are. Love others as you are commanded to do, as your neighbors. And love each other as family in the exact same way 
with that same agape, self-sacrificing love that God gives you. All God's people said, Heavenly Father, this is a hard lesson to learn for many of us who, who want to be, who feel the, uh, the temptation to want to be forceful. But Lord, you've given us another way. You've given us a way that doesn't look like what the world expects of us. You've given us a way of service. You've given us a way to be a reflection of Christ in front of others. And again, we ask that as, as those that are within the sound of my voice, whether here within these walls or those that are participating through our media ministry, whatever the case, that you continue to transform us into the image of your Son, and that through that image, your salvation would be made known to a world that doesn't understand it. That you are a God that never leaves nor forsakes your children. Help us to be parents. Help us to be brothers and sisters in Christ that never leave nor forsake your people who also remain by your side as faithfully as you have remained by ours. Draw us together at the altar, Lord, for those that have yet to come to know you in a free pardon of sin, for those who are struggling with the idea of where they belong and what family of God they belong, for those that just need a special touch from you because the weight of this world is too much for them. Whatever the case may be, as we draw into the service of the invitation, Lord, we ask that you would bring them forward so that they might be the beneficiaries of your embrace. But in all cases, Lord, let your will be done in this service. Bless the music. Bless the hearts of those before me. And may your love reign in all things. And it is in the most holy name of Christ we pray. And all God's people said. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share His Word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you and may God bless you and keep you.